Tyrannosaurus rex, the tyrant lizard king and the largest known carnivorous dinosaur, is one of the most famous and well-studied dinosaurs in the entire world. They are powerful and terrifying predators, and because of that, they've captured the attention and wonder of folks all around the world. Despite the fact that they're a household name, there's many misconceptions about tyrannosaurs that are still talked about today. They have a rather extensive history, which led to them becoming the tyrant lizard king we know and love today. The first fossils for these animals were found in 1874, but at the time, they weren't known to be T-Rex. It wouldn't be until 1900 that a man by the name of Barnum Brown found the first partial Tyrannosaurus rex skeleton. Two years later, he found another partial Tyrannosaurus skeleton, and three years after that, Henry Fairfield Osborne named the animal Tyrannosaurus rex. With a name like the Tyrant Lizard King, this specimen held the attention of media for several years before Tyrannosaurus kind of fell off. In the 1960s, there began a renewed public interest in paleontology, which funded expeditions all over the world. This would lead to multiple important events across paleontology, including the dinosaur renaissance. For those of you that don't know, the dinosaur renaissance was a huge event in paleontology that reshaped the way we view dinosaurs as a whole. It was led mainly by two men, John Ostrom and Robert Backer. These two were the first to show us that birds were directly related to dinosaurs and that they were warm-blooded. Their views and theories led to a time known as the Dinosaur Renaissance, which is technically still going today. The Renaissance is what shifted not only scientific, but also public perception that dinosaurs were sluggish and slow-moving animals. Instead of being slow and sluggish animals, Ostrom and Backer showed us that they were fast-moving and warm-blooded creatures. This led to an overall renewed public interest in dinosaurs. This led to new public interest in Tyrannosaurus rex itself and resulted in many new specimens being found over the following years. In the 90s, everything changed again when two new, nearly complete specimens were found. One of these was a tyrannosaur named Sue, named after the woman who found it, Sue Hendrickson. Today, this specimen is still the most complete tyrannosaur ever found, between 85 to 90 percent complete. And you can actually visit Sue yourself by going to the Chicago Field Museum. Over the following years, more and more tyrannosaur specimens were found, eventually leading us to the one known as Jane. If you weren't aware, this is where the debates really began to get intense around Nano Tyrannus. This whole situation began in 1988 when a specimen from 1946 was reclassified from Gorgosaurus to a new species, Nano Tyrannus. However, in 1999, this specimen was revealed to be a juvenile, not an adult like originally thought. Which led most paleontologists to classify this as a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex. But in 2001, Jane was discovered. After some debate, many paleontologists, including those who had originally believed Nano Tyrannus was valid, swapped sides. Over the years, those who still support Nano Tyrannus have tried to prove multiple different theories to separate the two genuses. This includes, but is not limited to, things like a difference in tooth count and proportionally different sized arms. However, when it comes to T-Rex, most of those things could be explained by individual variation. We'll talk more about the Nano Tyrannus situation a little bit later into this video. Regardless, simply because of how many specimens we have, Tyrannosaurus rex is one of the most well-studied dinosaurs on the planet, which is why it gets so much media attention all the time and why so many different dinosaurs are compared to it. Before we continue, let's talk about some of the most interesting Tyrannosaur specimens that we found. At the Pioneer Trails Regional Museum in North Dakota, there's a specimen known as PTRM4667. This specimen is important because it shows tooth marks from other tyrannosaurs, indicating that they cannibalized each other at least after death. Another specimen that's been talked about a lot recently is one known as E.D. Cope, or Copium Rex, specimen BHI6248. This specimen has been controversial recently because there's been proposed ideas that it could be the largest tyrannosaur specimen ever found. While no official papers have come out in any capacity to support this idea, I've seen the breakdowns of why people think this, and honestly, I'm pretty convinced. If you want more information on this topic, make sure to check out this video by a page called Vividian. And I would like to note, even though I believe Cope could definitely be the largest tyrannosaur ever found, until an official study is out, I'm still gonna say that Scotty is, but we'll talk about him later. This next specimen doesn't have a number, but it has one of the coolest names and a very interesting history. This is the Dueling Dinosaurs, a specimen that was found with a Tyrannosaurus and a Triceratops locked in a deadly battle. This was one of the most complete Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops specimens ever found, with the Rex specifically being 98% complete. The issue was that the specimen was found on land that belonged to two different families. These families were the Murrays and the Seversons, and the Murrays, because the fossils were found on their land, originally tried to sell it to multiple different museums. They were almost successful until 2016 when the Seversons started causing some kind of issue. 
You see, the Murrays had finally found a buyer in the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, but the Seversons, for some reason, owned control of the mineral rights on their land. Seversons argued that the fossils should be considered minerals and therefore belonged to them and weren't the Murrays to sell in the first place, and began a lengthy legal battle over it. From what I can tell, the Seversons didn't want to sell it to a museum and wanted to keep it as a private piece. For some time, the Seversons got what they wanted because in 2018, a judge ruled that fossils could be considered minerals under Montana state law. However, in 2020, the Montana Supreme Court overruled this and allowed the fossil to be purchased by the museum. With the fossil firmly in paleontologists' hands, hopefully we can find out more about these guys sooner than later. This specimen named Trix, or RGM 792000, is currently held in the Naturalis Biodiversity Center in Leiden, Netherlands. Trix is important because she may very well be the oldest known Tyrannosaur specimen. And last but certainly not least, we have Stan, or BHI-3033, the other very highly complete Tyrannosaur specimen found in the 90s alongside Sue. Stan has the most complete Tyrannosaur skull ever found, and it itself is the fifth most complete Tyrannosaur specimen. There are more casts of Stan than any other Tyrannosaur specimen ever found, and because of that, more people have seen Stan than any other Tyrannosaur. Frighteningly, in 2020, the specimen was sold to a mysterious and anonymous buyer who didn't reveal themselves at the time, and many of us thought the specimen gone for good. In 2022, however, Abu Dhabi's Department of Culture and Tourism came out and announced that they had purchased the fossil and planned to use it in a new natural history museum supposed to open in 2025. So hopefully scientists will have access once again. These specimens are just the tip of the iceberg, and it shows you why Tyrannosaurus is so well studied. Because of how well studied they are, we actually know a significant amount about them. Like modern birds, before they laid their eggs, adult female tyrannosaurs would have created something known as medullary tissue. This tissue provides the rex with the calcium needed to create their eggs. Like many dinosaurs who would eventually become giants, young tyrannosaurs started off as incredibly small creatures who gained a significant amount of weight as the years went on. We have several tyrannosaur specimens that show growth rings, which allow us to determine how fast this animal grew as well. Young tyrannosaurs stayed much smaller than you'd expect for a much longer period of time. Up until around five years old is when they really start to put on weight, but before then they stay relatively small, likely relying on either their parents or being small predators to find food. By the time they'd reach 10 years old, most of these animals would be around 4,000 pounds or 1,800 kilograms, still a long shot from the giants they would eventually be. It wouldn't be until around 12 to 13 years old that these animals really started to tack on massive amounts of weight. It's thought that they could put up upwards of 1,300 pounds or 600 kilograms a a year until they hit 18, at which point their growth starts to slow down again. It should also be noted that this seems to differ depending on the location of the Tyrannosaur. It seems that Tyrannosaurs were able to slow their growth and metabolism and allow themselves to eat less food in environments where there was less food. Which is why some significantly older specimens are around the same size as some significantly younger specimens. All known Tyrannosaurus rex specimens seem to have died before they hit 30 years old, usually within six years of reaching sexual maturity. They likely spent the last portions of their lives preparing the next generation to tackle the challenges of their prehistoric world. Even on average, these young and tiny Tyrannosaurs could eventually become something incredibly massive. As you might already know, Tyrannosaurs are absolutely massive animals, averaging around 5 to 8 tons. But the largest individuals could become true monsters. This fossil, nicknamed Scotty, is the largest known Tyrannosaurus rex specimen on Earth. Measuring 43 feet or 13 meters and weighing nearly 10 whopping tons, he is easily one of the largest predatory animals to have ever walked this Earth. Our study of Tyrannosaur growth is actually the biggest opponent to Nanotyrannus becoming its own species again. Let's take a moment and ignore the supposed morphological differences, because most of those can be explained by individual variation. Instead, let's look at the actual specimens and their size and growth. While many of the Nanotyrannus specimens have been claimed as adults or nearly adults, this actually isn't true. In fact, most of these specimens, including Jane, are immature and young individuals. I'm sure you've heard of the more recent paper by Nicholas Longrich about Nanotyrannus maybe being a valid species again. My biggest issue with the paper is the fact that they used the growth rings to try and justify their claims. They saw that the specimens they were studying were slowing down on their growth, with their growth rings becoming closer and closer to each other, showing that they didn't grow as much per year. They believed that this meant that the specimens were nearing full maturity and were almost done growing completely. Paleontologist Thomas Carr said that Longrich and his associates don't fully understand Tyrannosaur growth rates. 
As I mentioned earlier, it wouldn't be until around 12, 13, and maybe even slightly later for some specimens that they really started to put on major weight. As shown in a 2020 paper by Holly Woodward, no nanotyrannus specimen is over the age of 13 years old and actually fits perfectly within the expected growth rates of Tyrannosaurus rex. To be fully honest with you, Nanotyrannus only has one real shot to become an actual valid genus. For that, we would have to find a fully grown Nanotyrannus specimen, one that doesn't fit within the expected growth curve of Tyrannosaurus rex. Until then, Nanotyrannus is just another synonym of Tyrannosaurus rex. While there's no confirmation that Tyrannosaurs ever hunted in packs in any way, shape, or form, we do expect that they had some sort of social behavior. It's thought that they may have behaved similarly to wolves, where they have small, tight-knit family circles instead of large packs. It's also completely plausible that Tyrannosaurs were solo hunters and never really stuck together as a whole except for mating. And Tyrannosaur hunting is a whole nother debate and topic in itself. To talk about their hunting, we really need to talk about their brain and abilities. Like birds, these animals would be capable of rapid head and eye movements, a trait thought to originate in earlier Solurosaurs. This, coupled with the placement of their eyes, gives them some of the best known vision in the animal kingdom. Like many predators, they have forward-facing eyes, and a perimetry test was done to test how good these eyes really were. The study showed that they had a binocular range of 55 degrees, significantly better than hawks or eagles. The study concluded that their eyesight was at least three times better than any modern eagle or hawks, and at least 13 times better than a modern human. The best human eyes on Earth can maybe see objects about a mile away. It's thought that a tyrannosaur could see for nearly four miles. So they have amazing eyes. Their ears are also incredible as well. A study of their ears shows that they had a relatively large cochlea, which allows them to hear extremely low-frequency sounds. The ability to hear low-frequency sounds means Tyrannosaurs could track their prey from a significantly farther distance away, even more than they can see with their eyes. It would also help them find prey in thick and dense forests, much like their sense of smell. Studies of the brain show us that Tyrannosaurus rex has incredibly large olfactory bulbs, which are the portion of the brain that controls how good your smell is. This has had their sense of smell compared to modern vultures, which can scent carcasses miles away, and would imply that Tyrannosaurus had probably one of the best senses of smell in the animal kingdom. Their brain is exceptionally large for a dinosaur, and when you combine all their senses together, you can see why. This higher brain power also gives Tyrannosaurs an extra edge when it comes to hunting. Because of how powerful their brain and eyes are, they can likely pick their moments best when to strike. This was likely an adaptation to dealing with the large armored herbivores they would have had to hunt on a regular basis. Because their brain is more powerful and capable of solving minor problems, they can wait until they find the right opening to get in and strike their prey. This minimizes any risk to the wrecks because even though they're massive and powerful creatures, they're still vulnerable to damage. They'd wait for just the right moment before going in and striking with a powerful set of jaws capable of using over 12,000 pounds per square inch. Oh, and on top of all that, nowadays we know that they had soft cushion pads on their feet similar to elephants which would help them walk around much more stealthily. I know, a stealthy T-Rex kind of contradicts what most of you have in your mind's eye. Over the course of history, Tyrannosaurus has often been depicted as a giant slow-moving reptile that you couldn't miss even if you wanted to. However, nowadays we know that they were most likely warm-blooded and relatively stealthy predators despite their massive size. You may have heard something in the past about people claiming that Tyrannosaurus is exclusively a scavenger. And I'm here to tell you, that's not true. This debate began all the way back in 1917, with one scientist proposing that they weren't hunters at all because they didn't have much wear and tear on their teeth. However, nowadays we know that Tyrannosaurs and other dinosaurs constantly replace their teeth, so that argument isn't really valid. In modern times, a paleontologist known as Jack Horner has been the main proponent of this theory. He points out their highly developed sense of smell, a trait they share with modern scavengers like the vulture. Because they're relatively slow animals as well, he used this to say that they wouldn't really be able to chase prey down either. He's also made a weird argument that the arms wouldn't be useful tools in hunting, and sure, while they wouldn't really be all that useful in hunting, neither would Carnotaurus arms or many modern predators who don't even use their limbs to hunt all that much in general. This was really the beginning of Jack Horner's downfall, because he pushed this theory so far that he lost a significant amount of his scientific credibility. Today, people like to make fun of and clown Jack Horner, but in all honesty, he's still a paleontologist and he's done a lot of amazing work in the past and shouldn't just be remembered for one crackpot theory, even though he did push it really hard. Today, it's been widely accepted that Tyrannosaurus rex was both a hunter and a scavenger, hunting when it needed to and taking the opportunity to scavenge whenever it came up. 
Tyrannosaurus Rex would have been the apex of their environment, but it's a lot more complicated than just being an apex. Tyrannosaurus itself is from Laramidia, the western continent that today makes up half of North America. They had an extensive range on this continent, all the way from the north in places like Canada and possibly as far south as New Mexico. They seemed to be able to enjoy a multitude of environments, from more coastal regions to more densely wooded areas. In Hell Creek, they would have lived in sort of a tropical redwood forest, but would have likely also had coastal access from here. In the more southern parts of their environment, Tyrannosaurs would have encountered dry inland plains with sparse forests dotted around. And in the Lance Formation of Wyoming, it was thought that this was more of a bayou swamp type of area, and they would have lived here as well. They shared their territory with a variety of dinosaurs, like in Montosaurus, Triceratops, and Pachycephalosaurus, and they were the dominant predators. I've been asked before, where are all the mid-sized predators, because we haven't really found that many that lived alongside Tyrannosaurus. The closest thing would have been the relatively large predator known as Dakota Raptor. Unfortunately, this dromaeosaur is still the subject of debate and we aren't entirely sure what that could mean. Aside from Dakota Raptors, if they were actually there or not, the only real competition they would have had are Quetzalcoatlus. But Quetzalcoatlus is still an enormous animal and wouldn't really fill the medium-sized predator role. Instead, that mid-sized predator role is thought to have been filled by juvenile tyrannosaurs. When we were talking earlier about tyrannosaur growth, you may have noticed that there's about a two to four year period where they're not really growing all that much. By combining that information with their mortality rates, we can see where all the medium-sized predators are. It was thought that as infants, they had an incredibly high mortality rate, but this began to dramatically slow the older they got. By the time they hit that first big growth stage of around 4,000 pounds, they would have been the perfect mid-sized carnivores. And their delayed growth may actually be a way to niche partition between the adults and the juveniles. The juveniles with their much lighter but sturdy build would have been able to take on much smaller and faster dinosaurs than the adults. This would have kept the competition relatively low between the two until such a time as the younger animals begot to get older and put on much more weight. I mentioned before that most adults seem to die within 10 years of reaching full maturity. Their mortality likely increases for several reasons, one being a much harsher and more battle-filled life because they're bigger, slower animals, and two being the stress of reproduction. And it's thought that 30 years is about the maximum lifespan of a Tyrannosaurus rex. Tyrannosaurus rex is the single most famous dinosaur. They are not simply just sheer power, but also complex and interesting creatures. The dominant predator of North America, they truly were the Tyrant Lizard King. Hey folks, once again, thank you all so very much for watching. It's a new year, which means new discoveries, and I can't wait to share it with you all. If you've been watching me for a while, I just have to say thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart, because I couldn't do any of this without you folks. If you're new here, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you more often. But as always, folks, remember to be good people, and I'll see you guys in the next one.